You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I'd like to begin our proceedings here today by calling out to the helping spirits to be with us. So I call out to all of your helping spirits and all of mine. I call out to your good, true, and beautiful ancestral helping spirits and to mine. I call out to those energies uh, in the ancestral realm that are of our bloodline and those that serve us as ancestral helping spirits that are not of this particular mix that moves in our blood in this particular life. I call out to these ancestors all and helping spirits all to be with us here today to gather round to help us, to support us, the living, to do what we are called to do in our time. And as the challenges of our time become more crystal clear, let us rise to those challenges with deep passion in our bellies, with a sense of truth in our hearts, and that kind of clarity in our minds that allows us to get things done. And so I call out to the human ancestors to help us to understand what is ours to do as the humans and to help us to do it in a good way, in a way that is good for all living things. And let us do what needs to be done for those who are coming. And as these ancestral human, ancestral helping spirits and others gather around, let us reach beyond the humans to those energies that have been here on the earth long before there was ever a human. And those energies that will be here long after. We call out to these uh, ancestral energies that are the spirits of nature, of the animals and the bugs and the birds and the fishes and all the different forms of life, the plant life the geographic life, all of the many kinds of life that move in a great interconnected web here on Earth. And we ask these energies to help us, the humans, as they always have, to help us with that one thing we never seem to be able to get right, which is how to live together in a good way. And may we learn from the beauty and complexity of the Earth's ecosystems, may we learn from the diversity and harmony of the way those systems work and gain their strength and power through that dynamic. May we see the awe of the physical world around us and learn from it how to be better humans. And so we call out to these ancestral energies as well and invite those non-human energies to come in. And as all of these energies circle around us here today, let us call ourselves in from wherever we might be into our head. And with the next breath, draw ourselves down and connect in our hearts. And with the next breath, draw ourselves down and connect in our bellies and know male, female, non-gender specific, non-binary, whatever kind of human beings you perceive of yourself to be, you are only fully human. When you inhabit your head and your heart and your belly and you choose to be here now. So let us not live this day in our heads. Let us move our awareness down and give thanks to the earth for life itself, for this physical experience of reality. Let's send our energy down through all the layers of this beautiful earth, down to the center of the earth to anchor ourselves firmly there and connect in to those energies so often maligned in our contemporary world because they draw their sense of strength and power from silence, from stillness, from peace, from darkness. And so let us reach into those energies and draw them up into ourselves and into our day in a way that nourishes and restores and brings into our body all the wisdom of manifestation, how to be here in form in a good way. Let us draw that energy up and use that energy to educate us, help us to settle into ourselves and know who we are, know where we stand, and to know what we stand for. 
and to let those things that have heart and meaning really move us in our lives. And may these energies of the earth teach us about connection and interconnection within ourselves as we come into right relationship with all the many perspectives that are within each human. That we come into right relationship with each other, with our environment and with the invisible world. And as we move into these many concentric, nested relationships that make up a human life, let us maybe today have a moment of connecting into the oneness, into that place in which we are all connected. And may you take your sense of right relationship, not from things you read on the internet, not from things other people tell you, including me. May you take your sense of right relationship from your place in the oneness. And then draw that energy up from your belly to your heart, your heart to your mind, and reach out through the sky above and whatever weather it holds, reaching out through our very thin and precious atmosphere and out into the cosmos, all the way out and up to the highest power of the universe by whatever name you know that energy, however you conceive of it, whatever that is for you, connect to this radiant divine light and draw it down into your day into these proceedings, into your own body. And in this way, call in that essence energy of blessing into your life. Call in that essence energy of protection into your life. Draw in the benevolence of this universe and let it move within you, bringing inspiration and illumination and innovation and inspiring that creativity that exists in the human spirit. And as you draw that energy into your body, let it extend all the way down and connect to the center of the earth. So with earth and sky connected within you, allow yourself to feel into that deep, rich, and ancient relationship. And allow it to awaken the love that moves in your own heart. And by this, I don't really care about your romantic love or who you do and don't want to do it with. And all those small human ways that we often get lost in defining love. But I invite you to open to the power of love that exists in your heart that truly can reach out and connect into the oneness And see yourself as a larger cosmic being than you did before. And let your heart open up. And in your heart, may you come to feel some sense, some inkling, some understanding of why your heart bothers to beat in this day. Why are you here? What is it that your life force is organized around the you that you are to do in this day? And may you find courage in that very same heart to do something large or small, to bring those gifts literally manifest into the world. So for all the spirit help that we have to do that, I give enormous gratitude. May what needs to be said be said here today and what needs to be heard be heard. And may these proceedings go forward in a way that is good for all living things. Speaking of living things, I would like to give thanks to some human being living things. I give thanks to Raina and Rebecca, to Jenny and Randall, Deborah, Karen, and all of the other listeners who have donated financially to Why Shamanism Now in the last couple of weeks. I'm deeply grateful for you. For those of you that are listening for the first time, Why Shamanism Now is listener supported. And that means it is listeners like you who offer their humble donations so that we can keep the show live, keep it, the archives um, available free to anyone who can get themselves onto the internet and download. And so I give great gratitude to those of you that feel moved by this show and allow that which moves your heart to motivate your actions in the world. Thank you for donating financially. Thank you for drawing the teachings into your life and using them. Thank you for bringing them to your journey circles and wrestling with them. And thank you for the questions that you share that come out of it. May you continue to be ever so creative in doing whatever you can do to help the show to grow. And so I'm grateful for all of you. If you don't know how to donate, you can go to whyshamanismnow.com, click on the support button and donate any amount, large or small. And if you are uncomfortable donating um, on the internet, you can email me at christina at lastmaskcenter.org and I would be happy to give you a physical address for a physical old-fashioned check. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, today our topic is mental health, first responders, and the nobility of the soul. We are live today, so if you have questions about today's topic, you are welcome to call in at 512-772-1938, or you can Skype in from the co-creatornetwork.com site. We're always happy to take live calls, but we also know that many of you listen to the podcast whenever you can, and we're grateful for that as well. And you can email me at christina at lastmaskcenter.org if you have questions. So I thought I would start today with a little story and move on from there. Um, Part of what is generating today's show, today being um, October 8th, 2019, part of what's generating today's show is a um, preponderance of articles coming out in the United States, at least right now, about the rising suicide rate in first responders. So first responders are those people that have the um, ever so challenging job to do the things in contemporary life nobody else wants to do like show up to a home where someone has been deceased unbeknownst to everyone else for three days. The people that show up in the midst of disasters to help us, the people that, as I said, do the things others can't and others don't want to. So these people really deserve the best in some way because they show up for us when we are at our worst. And so I wanted just to talk today about how hard it is for me to be in a world that says, oh my goodness, the suicide rate of first responders in the United States is uh, is 20% higher than the average American, which is already probably too high. Oh my goodness, we don't know why, what shall we do? Because the truth of the matter is, one thing humanity has known how to deal with since pretty much the beginning of humans on the planet is how to deal with soul loss. And for whatever arguments y'all might want to get into about appropriation and using the word shaman, the bottom line is shamanic practitioners, by whatever way they come to that skill set, they are using that skill set around the world to deal with soul loss and in doing so they are dealing with the very issue that these first responders are dealing with that lead to the kind of what seem like intractable problems that leave a person feeling there's only one way out and the hard thing about that other than the obvious hard thing about it is that it isn't a way out. And so, let me just take a moment and share this story about working with the dead. Because we actually need to understand death differently if we're going to understand life differently. And I really think if we're going to solve the problems we all as a human family share on the face of this planet right now, we need to start to see life differently. So let's start with death. Okay, so back in 2001, in September, I was in New York. And at that point in time, New York was dealing with the aftermath of um, the events that are now called in the United States, at least, September 11th. And... From a perspective of every day on the street being in Manhattan at that time, the biggest issue was just there was way more dead people in Manhattan than normal. And being an urban city with much um, alienation and disenfranchisement and um, loneliness and people dying with nobody knowing, it's already a city with with a long history from a North American perspective and lots of dead people hanging around. Now, for those of you in much older cities than New York, which would be on the other side of the globe, largely, you know what it's like to live with a bunch of dead people hanging around. So anyway, 
so here we are in Manhattan post event Manhattan itself as a city is grieving and as I said there's a lot of extra dead people wandering around not knowing what happened and um, what to do and so with many 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 other people I'm not at all trying to show that I was doing anything special but along with many other people that have the skills to escort the souls of the dead um, from he, being stuck here in the realm of the living across to where the dead are meant to go. Um, this is called, by the way, this is called psychopomp to escort the soul. This is called death walking. Um, you can Google that and you'll probably take you to Kelly Harrell. It does a beautiful draw, job training people in this practice. Um, so tending the dead, the bardos in a Buddhist tradition. So this is, this is a act, an action. A process that human beings have um, done for a very long time because, of course, with human beings living, there's human beings dying. And so here we are in New York, and I was there doing uh, work with the living, a lot of shamanic healing with the living, and um, many people who lost, for example, their entire business or their entire office full of colleagues in September 11th. So there were a whole bunch of people dealing with a level of death that was not part of their ordinary life. Now, if you're someone who lives in a refugee camp or have lived in a refugee camp or a war-torn part of the planet, you know what these people were experiencing. And granted, generally speaking, since the Civil War, most people living in North America haven't experienced that type of challenge. Okay, So here we are, people dealing with uh, massive, un, uh, violent, um, unexpected death. Okay, so at the end of each day, I just made a commitment – to use the last hour of my rented space I had to work in to work with the dead. And I did this for about a month. And in that process, I came upon, a, well, first, a lot of civilians. And for those civilians that lost their life on that day and didn't really know what had happened – basically just explaining what had happened and helping and just sort of pointing the way to where they needed to go was largely all that needed to be done. And so one of the traditional things in working with the dead is to create an energetic bridge between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead, which is often referred to as a rainbow bridge. I realize that phrase is used to speak to many other things these days. If you in traditional ceremonies to move large numbers of dead from um, an event, from a place where an event has occurred to the land of the dead, often a rainbow bridge is constructed. And it's a construction that occurs like many shamanic things do, do in this sort of co-created dynamic between the living here on earth and their helping spirits. Okay, so back to New York. So I'm in New York, been doing this for a few nights, and I have constructed not a rainbow bridge with the help of spirit, but a rainbow elevator. Because urban people, you know, they track better with the whole elevator idea than the bridge idea. So there we go. So we have this beautiful rainbow elevator that many civilians are using. I even play, post instructions there. So if dead people happen to wander by and wonder what, what's this pretty sparkly rainbow elevator thing all about, there's instructions they can read and use it even when I'm not there. And so as the days go by, um, each time I arrive at the base of my rainbow elevator, there's people milling about and I say, come on, get on board, let's go. And so we start moving, crossing people over. And one almost comical uh, time, if we can consider talking to the dead comical, was as the 
newly dead people from the event of September 11th began to chat with other dead people who had been dead for who knows how long in Manhattan and started inviting them, hanging out with them, waiting for me to arrive the next day. And then everybody would cross, use the rainbow elevator like it was a big dead party. Um, So that was kind of funny because I started being there with people that were showing up and my sense of them is they weren't really contemporary thinking and they weren't contemporary dressed. It was very interesting before I realized, oh, these are just random dead people from Manhattan using the elevator. And I'm thinking, well, why not? Right. It is not good for the dead to be with the living, uh, for the living or the dead and, and vice versa. So about the second week, because I've been re, re, uh, re, re, returning, sorry, returning to the same place again and again in the journey world, the resolution for me is starting to become more clear. I'm a, I'm not a very visual journeyer myself. I'm much more of a felt experience kind of person. I don't really wait around to get all the details. I'm not one of those people that needs to like prove my journey factually. As long as the energy moves and I get results here in the physical world, that is good enough for me. But when I return to the same place again and again and again, eventually the resolution um, raises. Okay, so I'm going from grainy to kind of high definition. And I start to realize in this pile of rubble that is at the base of my rainbow elevator, that there are these lumps there that don't really look like rubble. They actually look like the backs of people buried in the rubble. And I go to one of these people buried in the rubble and I kind of tap this person on the shoulder and um, realize that um, it's a person um, as I as I suspected, but that they're kind of just plain dead. <laughs> I'm like, um, okay, I know you think you're playing dead, but you're actually really dead. I mean, it's it's been easily two weeks since this event, and the um, the man said to me, "I am waiting. They will find me." And I'm thinking, who are you talking about? And in this conversation that unfolded with this dead man, what I began to feel coming from him is this profound belief in his heart through that particular kind of intimacy that is created when we human beings do hard things together and survive. Or we do hard things together and suffer loss together. And that in, I f- could feel in this man's heart his absolute unshakable belief that his fellow firefighters would rescue him and revive him and he would live to fight fires another day. And it took actually me realizing I was not going to win the argument to get things to change. Because I was arguing with him about how long he'd been dead, all these rational reasons he should stand up out of this pile of rubble and use the elevator. And I realized I wasn't going to win that argument because this truth was so deeply alive in his heart and at the time of death that it was unshakable, which of course was very moving for me as well. But I also needed to do my job, which I said to him. I said, okay, I get it. You're doing your job, but I need to do mine. And so I cheated. I asked him to help me. And he said, sure, ma'am, what would you like? Of course, because he's a first responder. Of course he is going to help me. And so I admitted I cheated. I stepped out of the argument we were having and played to his strengths. And I asked him if he could help me get his buddies to help us move all these other dead civilians up this elevator. Absolutely, sure. And all of a sudden, I got guys and women, but mostly guys, piling out of this pile of rubble and helping. Got all these dead firefighters now helping me help the civilians. So with all of their help, 
the civilians in the area got moved on pretty quickly. And so what remained then were the firefighters. And I couldn't figure out how to get them to go. They were happy to help me, but they wouldn't go themselves. And so finally, uh, a particular ghost comes over to me and is firefighter ghost and introduces himself as chief. And I say, okay, like I said, I'm not one of those people that goes for big provable details. I go, okay. And, uh, I talk with the chief about the reality of the situation because he seems to be willing to sort of process strategy. And so he agrees to work with me to get all of these firefighters and other first responders to go up the elevator and to assist the the sort of story is they're going to assist me from up there. And the thing about the other end of the elevator is that once we're at the other end of the elevator, we are no longer in the realm of the living. We have moved into the just before fully transitioning into this realm of spirit where where you go when you die, wherever that is, the whatever comes next, that you cross through that threshold and on you go into the hands of spirit and you and spirit go do whatever happens on that part of the exchange. And generally speaking, in psychopomp work, there's really no need to go beyond that because the any spirit that can cross through that threshold is met by other spirit energies and the spirit side of things happens. It's not your job. Your job is just to get them there. Okay. So the chief and I begin to move this whole chain of – firefighters and other first responders up to the top of the elevator where they now find themselves in a different environment now the chief didn't know this but somehow being the chief he understood that something had to change from the sort of status quo we'd established at the bottom of the elevator so we're at the top of the elevator now and he looks around And he looks at me, and at this point, I can feel him. I can't see him clearly, but I can feel him clearly. And I I feel that place in our mind and our heart where we as a human being suddenly get it, like we suddenly get the bigger picture. I felt him click into that, oh, suddenly getting it. And then he asks me what needs to happen next. And I explain to him. excuse me, that these people, all these first responders, they need to spread out and go and reconcile their life. And that when they feel their life is reconciled, which could be now, I mean, they could be reconciled, but they need to to run through that, then, um, then they'll be able to pass through this threshold. And I show him where the threshold is. And he starts to walk up the steps to the threshold and stops halfway and comes back down. And he looks at me again with this uh, feeling that I felt from his heart of this great knowing, you know, that home is on the other side of that threshold and that he's not going to go there yet. And this is when I realize in the journey, largely because I think my helping spirits are whispering this in my ear at this point, that he is not going to go until every single other firefighter and first responder has gone first. That he is responsible for these people. And that just because they're dead doesn't mean his responsibility is done. And so at this point in time in my journey, I've completely lost it. I'm sobbing. I'm crying. I, I am so moved by the nobility of the soul in these people. They're just people, right? They're just regular schmoes, right, who get a job, do the training, and become firefighters or first responders. They're just people like everybody else. This is their job. They just go to work. They do their job. And and the incredible quality in the hearts of these people um, has me like on my knees. So anyway, I also know my time is running up on my rental space in Manhattan and I need to get out of there and get on with my 
night, basically. And so I thank him, and he says that he'll just stay there at the top of the elevator and direct, basically direct traffic, encourage people to come up, send people to reconcile their lives. When they're done reconciling their lives, he'll send them through the threshold and that he'll just be there and do that. And so for the next two weeks, as I'm checking in on a basically daily basis to do more and more work and deal with more and more strange things going on at the bottom of the elevator, I arrive at the top and there's the chief. Absolutely patient, dedicated, greeting people, helping people, and, um, and and yet responding very differently to the firefighters and the first responders. That there's there's this real sense of he's happy to help the civilians, but there is this sense of a completion of his duty when the firefighters arrive and the other EMTs and all these guys and and women. And so as my time in Manhattan is running to a close, because I was only there for a month, I need to go back home to Seattle after that, um, I tell him that, you know, tomorrow night's going to be my last night, and I, I personally, in doing my work, would feel better if he would be willing to cross through the threshold. And the reality of the situation was we hadn't been crossing a lot of first responders for several days now. Mostly it was civilians, other dead, just random dead New Yorkers from who knows what time at that point. And, um, and so the night, bef- so I go home that night and I'm making my dinner and I'm watching the news. And by this point, many weeks after the event, there's there, the new day being the news, the newscasters are willing to start to name people they are sure are deceased. There was a lot of confusion about who was missing and who wasn't, and many people reported on multiple lists. So it, it took a long time for many reasons to start to name names. Um, but on this particular newscast that was happening while I was cooking my dinner, they they named names honoring the uh, captain and other firefighters of particular um, firehouses that were in that area and were hit very, very hard um, with lots of loss in this event. And um, I'm in the middle of cooking and holding something in my hand and probably a spatula in the other hand and I look at this newscast and I see the face of a man and I realize it's the chief and that somehow in all of this repetition of these journeys I get it as I as I see his actual face in an actual photo that this is the same energy and um it really stops me in my track. I drop whatever I'm holding on to, make a big mess in the kitchen. As I see the faces of these first responders go by on the screen, and I realize that that I've touched the souls of many of these men and women. And when I arrive the next night, for my last time of helping the dead to cross over. Um, the chief is there, but I can see him very clearly. And, and again, this is unusual for me in my journeys as I don't see things very clearly, but I see him very clearly. And he has a little bit of a smirk on his face, almost as if he's the one who planned the newscast. <laughs> so... Um, And so I thanked him, and he thanked me, at which point I dissolved into tears again. And something in that exchange with the chief, who was, of course, really a captain, but anyway, with the chief, made me forged a commitment, I guess, in my heart to try to support the nobility in the souls of this kind of person. And so in the end of that story, not to leave you hanging, the chief was willing to leave and cross through that threshold and 
was met at the threshold by not only all of his relations, which is what is normal, you meet your loved ones of your own sort of family lines, but by all of these men and women that had served with the chief, as peers with the chief at other times, this, the threshold was packed full of people as this really beautiful human being crossed. At which point I was, of course, reduced to tears yet again in my journey. And um, as I am right now. Okay, so this experience for me as a practitioner was not so much illuminating about the techniques of crossing souls over. Everything was really pretty textbook in a sense. What it was for me was a profound education about humans, their hearts and their souls, and the quality of uh, resonance that is cultivated in the heart of someone who believes deeply in what they are doing and what they are doing is of service to others. Because in today's time, there are many people that believe deeply in what they are doing, and what they are doing hurts other people. I mean, the essence of that would be a suicide bomber. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this in any way to judge. I'm just pointing out that profound fixation and belief and commitment to what you believe to be true without looking around to see the effect that has on others um, is not the same thing as someone who has deep commitment to what they are doing and cares to look around to make sure that what they are doing is actually beneficial to other living things. And so this is the type of person that is being discussed in these articles right now in the United States with a 20% higher suicide rate in people that are largely the type of person that has cultivated a heart like the chief. And I feel deeply committed to offering shamanic healing to anyone and I have to admit that in the effort to help the dead, there were some dead people that were a real pain in the ass. And they were proud of it. They'd been a pain in the ass as a human being living, and they were a pain in the ass as a ghost. And while I was happy to do my work well, and there's a certain satisfaction in a job well done, there is another kind of... Reciprocal generosity, reciprocal gratitude that happens when you do a job well done that assists this cultivation of those things in life that you value. And I value highly this nobility of the soul. So the point that I'm getting around to here. is that I would really love to live in a world where we did not, as trained professionals, continue to pretend like we don't know why first responders have a 20% higher suicide rate. There are many things we're discovering about human beings and their health, but one of them we have known for an excruciatingly long time is about the reality of soul loss as an actual thing and the very simple direct remedy to soul loss through shamanic skills, which is soul retrieval. And the kinds of things that create soul loss and have from the beginning of human beings on the planet are being in the presence of violence, in the presence of life-threatening accidents, 
to be startled, to be afraid, to be under the stress of dealing with people suffering, particularly people suffering in a crisis, like a flood, or people suffering in a prolonged, protracted situation like war and some kind of war or refugee situation, that all of these kinds of situations, which are the ones first responders jump into to help us, are exactly the kinds of experiences that cause soul loss, not just for those of us that would be harmed or like the victims of said flood, but the people coming in to try to help us. Because human beings can experience soul loss by being overwhelmed by the presence of other people's suffering. And so we only, each one of us at any point in time only has so much energy to hold ourselves together. And one of the ways contemporary people deal with being grossly overwhelmed by fear of death, uh, the inability to, to, to process tons of other people's suffering, tons of your own suffering, all this is we, a part of us splits off, allows us to numb out allows us to then figure out how to cope and carry on while we've left a piece of ourself behind. And I'm not going to argue for the reality of soul loss and soul retrieval today because, frankly, my life as well as the lives of many, many, many other people attest to its, the fact of it and the fact of its repair via soul retrieval and the fact of the ease of that repair for anyone who is suffering in a state of soul loss. Okay, so the issue that I see then is the way in which we culturally refuse to acknowledge in a conversation that talks about um, the military or firefighters or EMT or any of these people that are, are operating in this very real world of life or death. Oddly, we refuse to talk about the soul as an actual living, breathing part of this right in the world, life and death human being. And whatever it is in our ancestral history that keeps us from being able to have an intelligent, informed conversation about a human being, their uh, conscious actions in the world – and their soulful presence in the world at the same time, we simply need to get over whatever that ancestral stuff is. We can't afford to continue down this path that we are on as uh, in the Western world here, where we are playing dumb and acting as if we do not see soul loss all around us, that we do not experience it ourselves. And that we don't have a solution right here at hand that we have had for tens of thousands of years. This wheel doesn't need to be reinvented. It simply needs to be used. And so whatever that logic is in the medical world that refuses to acknowledge shamanic healing as a valid part of the landscape of healing practices needs to change. Whatever the deep cultural underpinnings are of being one of these first responder type of people but not tending to your energy and the health and well-being of your heart and your psychology as part of being someone in that job whatever that ancestral story is needs to change because the truth is if we go far enough back in our ancestors if we go beyond let's say, Judeo-Christian times. We go more ancient than that. We had warriors and we had war. That's not new. We had that at that time. This was not some fairy, fairy tale time when nobody did anything uh, lethal to each other. Of course we did. But we also had at that time, we being humanity, 
also had that time a shared understanding that war was a really atrocious thing because of all of the soul loss and the dead that that created. And so after war, warriors were brought back into the hands of the healers, were brought back into a process in which their soul loss, their psychology, um, their nobility of their soul would be restored. And now first responders are people that are stepping into this kind of extreme experience, perhaps not war itself, but some kind of accident or life-threatening situation um, repeatedly. And so they are stepping into situations with a lot of um, uncertainty, shock, fear, um, stress, suffering, death all the time, which are all the conditions for creating soul loss in a healthy person. And so for me, and I don't think I'm special in this, so for you too, for that place in your heart where you want to give back to those who give to you, where you want to tend those qualities that make us amazing, the nobility of our soul, the strength of our heart, the courage of our heart, the willingness to step in to the midst of it because you're the one who's there who can. Those qualities in the human beings deserve to be met by a culture that is willing to stop being blind to what is right in front of their faces. And so whatever ancestral patterns are behind the conditions that set us up here you know, because from September 11th to today is almost two decades. Unless I'm not doing my math right. 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. And we still can't acknowledge the need for people that live this kind of life, do this kind of work. We still can't acknowledge the simplicity of just bringing soul retrieval in to their everyday Healthcare, And I don't care. I'm not asking that it be reimbursed by the ridiculous insurance situation, health insurance situation the United States has. I'm just asking that we stop being willfully blind and allow these people who deserve the best we have to offer to suffer. And so I want to remind you of a couple things. The first is an interview from um, several years back. With Alex Seymour, he wrote a book called Psychedelic Marine. Alex was a Marine, actually, and his journey, The Psychedelic Marine, a transformational journey from Afghanistan to the Amazon, is about his, how he was forced by a system that did not help him deal with his PTSD. I mean, it it tried in its willfully blind way, but how he was willing to show some adaptability and go track down other options until finally he was able not only to bring healing to himself, but to then begin to work at how to help other uh, people like him find that healing as well, that restoration of those lost soul parts, the restoration of the psyche, and that ability to truly restore the nobility of his soul after these experiences. But Alex was one of my absolute favorite human beings to talk to because of like the chief because of this profound uh transformation of healing in his heart and while the chief was dead and um so thus the conversation not quite so robust talking to alex was amazing what a gracious human being right and so the other thing i want to draw your attention to is an organization called maps which um I'm actually spacing out on how to uh, remember what MAPS actually stands for. But basically, it is an organization that has really consistently been behind bringing different psychedelic uh, properties into basically assisted therapy. So like psilocybin-assisted therapy or MDMA-assisted therapy, but basically bringing these um, 
this, these active ingredients into an assisted therapeutic process to help to guide a person painstakingly um, through the same kind of repair. My idea here for us all today is what if we just added a shaman into the mix and just brought those soul parts back so that whatever assisted therapy could truly be the mending of this person who has already given so much to care for us. And so my request in this very long and unwieldy podcast here today is that you as the listener consider How am I part of this problem? How am I making assumptions and carrying forward a version of reality, a version of mental health, and a version of a definition of mental illness that propagates this willful blindness? And how could I become one of many people who needs to do this, change my way of seeing the world? change my way of seeing what the possibilities are and begin to advocate as a civilian or not civilian, as a, as a person, whatever you are in the world, whatever your sphere of influence is in the world, how can I begin to advocate for a change in the way we conceive of mental health, mental unwellness, which is the state a healthy person is in when they're in a state of soul loss. It's just mental unwellness and true mental illness, whatever that really means. And that we begin to advocate to bring not only um, assisted therapy in as valid therapy, but we begin to bring shamans into the therapy to help bring the soul parts back as quickly as possible so that the person's therapeutic work is not around the hole that is left by the soul part being gone, but is actually in knitting and reweaving the soul together again. And in this way, we move people that have a a true diagnosis of PTSD out of that syndrome and into um, a state of health and well-being where the nobility of their soul is restored. Now, I personally believe that for us to do this, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you've probably already done the easy steps, which is you're interested in shamanism because here you are listening to me here today. But what I invite people to do is to start to step into their own ancestral healing, to really deeply get at these myths, this willful blindness, this refusal to look there um, that is coming out of our more recent ancestors because our more ancient ancestors dealt with all this really well and they could help us deal with this today really well. But we've got this big old pile of unresolved ancestors in in between who not only didn't deal with it well in their lifetime, but their unresolved issues are propagating through us in our lifetime. And so I am inviting you to stand up today for the nobility of the soul. I'm inviting you to join me in healing with your well and unwell ancestors and to begin that work of changing your perspective on reality, changing your perspective on yourself and what is possible and beginning to function in the world as someone who is not buying into the collective Western blindness and assumptions that we are making about what is and isn't possible today. And for those who serve us, be they first responders or be they those in our, in our care like the children and the elders, um, I'm inviting you as the living to step into some real skillful work in how to get right with your well ancestors and begin to turn your unwell ancestors around. And uh, if you'd like to join me in this, we start tomorrow. October 9th, 2019, you can go to lastmaskcenter.org, click on the link, and join me in a seven-week class that will cover the basic skills that you need to begin to make these changes in your own life uh, for you, for the past, and for the generations that are coming. 
And speaking of those generations, uh, let me give thanks. Thanks to the ancestors that stand behind us, human and non-human. Thanks to the earth below and the sky above and the heart that unites us all. I ask each one of you to do something in this week to support and cultivate the nobility of your own soul. Thank you, everyone.